I'm a member of the Remake community, Remake Our World, which is a nonprofit. If you've ever heard of the Pay Up campaign, which has been huge throughout the coronavirus time, um, where a lot of clothing brands haven't been, they haven't been paying their garment workers at the end of the supply chain. And so they just, you know, like these people are starving in Bangladesh, Cambodia, China, India, all these places. And so Remake has done a lot of things like that. Um, at the end, I'll have a resources slide. So I think Sherry can, um, I'll share the PowerPoint or the slides with her and she can share them all with you. Or you can just take a picture of the resources slide, but we're doing an event with Remake. Um, my podcast, one of the directors, the director of business development and analytics for the podcast is doing um, a remake event with me and we're talking to three different panelists about greenwashing specifically. So I think we'll go into that a teeny little bit. And then also I'm doing an event soon with the Sustainable Fashion Alliance about how COVID has impacted small sustainable businesses. So if you want to join any of those, I'll send Sherry the links for that. But yeah, Alrighty, let's jump in. I'll share my screen, then let's jump into it. Yeah, so let's talk about the fashion industry's environmental injustices specifically, but we're also going to touch on the social yeah. issues. Uh, so what should we know before diving in? I think some really important points to make when we're thinking about the fashion industry. It's when I first started kind of diving down this rabbit hole is there are so many things that I just had no idea I had in my mind. and so I guess the main points that I want people to know before we start talking about these major events and other things like that is that fashion didn't used to be this way. Up until the 80s, fashion was pretty much clothes were custom made for each person. So there was no, you know, one size fits all. There was no, um, you know, small, medium, large, extra large, that kind of thing, because it was it was just, it was something that you bought and you bought to love and you bought to have for 10 years and it cost a lot more. And it was something that people, they were prized possessions. And then Selfridges, so Selfridges is a big department store in London that I spent way too much money at last summer <laughs> when I was studying abroad in London. Um, but he essentially he was American and he came to the UK and made shopping an activity. He made he made the shopping mall, essentially, he made the concept of a shopping mall that, where there were multiple different like makeup, clothes, shoes, all that in one location. And, um, and he made it so people didn't have to buy something when they were there. Shopping became a leisure activity. And so with that, shopping also became more of like a hobby and something that was made more of, of an object than the prized possessions that your clothes used to be. So, oopsies, there's a little typo there. Um, and so those who created the, he created the idea that the amount of clothes that we own kind of represents our status. So more clothes we have, more leisure we have, um, therefore, you know, we don't have to work because we have so much money and things like that. Um, and then now into present day, we've made it, so there used to be, I'm sure you guys have heard of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in 1912 that happened in New York City where there was a factory fire where they were making shirts, shirtwaists, um, and that killed, I think, over 100 people. And they've since moved factory, um, they've since moved garment factories offshores to places like India, places like China, places like Cambodia, Bangladesh, things like that. And because they have these very low regulations, low labor standards, lack of government enforcement. And I'll talk about the, um, I'll talk about the Rana Plaza collapse in a bit, but um, fashion follows poverty. And so that's why we don't see garment manufacturing facilities or nearly as much as we used to in the States. They've all been pushed so they can be made so much more cheap, so much more cheaply. Um, yeah, and exactly. So you can't sell clothes this cheap unless you cut those corners. So we'll talk about with Rana Plaza how the building was made illegally and it was made without proper building infrastructure and regulations. So another important point that I want to chat about is ethics versus sustainability. That's a really big thing. Um, people will talk about like the leather industry, the 
debate between vegan leather and um, virgin natural leather because virgin leather will, or, um, again, it can biodegrade, but vegan leather is often made from plastic and then virgin natural leather is often unethical, but it's more environmentally sustainable. And so, um, yeah, and so then the same with conventional cotton uses 25% of the world's pesticides. Ethics really talks about the, the human impact of things. So the chemicals that cotton farmers face, the issue that cotton farmers, you know, like they have severe health issues because of um, the crop and the pesticides that are used to farm that crop versus sustainability. So something like organic cotton is often more sustainable and provides a living wage to the farmers. So that's important to consider when you see something that it might say it's, um, it might say it's made, you know, with no, no child labor or something like that, but it also could be made with synthetic ingredients that will last in the in the environment for thousands of years and contribute to the microplastic pollution that we'll see and that we'll talk about in a bit. So these are some terrifying pictures from, I think the one on the bottom left is from China and then the two on the right are from Bangladesh. Um, but some of the major problems that we face in terms of environmental contamination in the fashion industry comes down to water scarcity points that I want to talk about in a little document. So the major problem with the Bangladesh garment industry, which is the US, the US's second largest textile importer, if you look at the tags of your clothes, you'll probably see made in Bangladesh or made in China or something like that. And um, water fluctuation and scarcity is the huge problem there. So there are three main rivers. I am it's bad to, I do not want to pronounce them, but Brahmaputra, Meghna, and the Gong originate in other countries, I think like China or something like that. And so when they flow, when they make their way into Bangladesh, the amount of water that actually gets into Bangladesh that is clean and drinkable and um, in that sense is quite limited. And also the contamination of that water from toxic effluents becomes a major issue because the garment indicated and can't be used for drinking water. Um, yeah, and so even the World Health Organization stated that the levels of arsenic in Bangladesh have contributed to the largest mass poisoning in history. Um, that it, it's affected an estimated 30 to 35 million people, which is crazy. And then there's been lots of scandals pertaining to water contamination and illegal dumping. Um, one example from China in 2013 and 2014 found that 32.2 billion tons of wastewater were released into the sea each year from the garment manufacturing facility I, and potentially other sources. And then in 2012, a, stag a staggering 68% of the discharge points in China had records for illegal discharge and 25% had never met the regulations and the national environmental standards in the first place, um, according to data from China's State and Ocean Administration. And that's an article from Greenpeace. And also, if you want me to attach any of these or send you any of them, I'm more than happy to as well. Um, and then also, so Greenpeace has a chapter in East Asia and they tested, they've done this study around the world and they tested clothes from two manufacturing cities and from those two manufacturing cities are 40% of all children's clothes that are shipped out from China. So I feel like that's a pretty good representative of the actual, you know, like what's, what kind of children's clothes you know, what, where they come from and how they're contaminated and things like that. Um, and the same chemicals in the wastewater were found in the clothes, the contaminated wastewater. And that's really scary considering that's, you know, that's what your children are putting on their skin. And I don't know, maybe this is like a college thing that me and Brianna would know, but like nicotine patches 
they're absorbed into your skin. Like it, your skin is your largest organ in your body and it's a natural, it's going to absorb things. And so it's very naive to think that that wouldn't happen with our clothes, that that wouldn't happen with the dyes in our clothes, with the pesticides that were used to grow the cotton in our clothes, the petroleum that was used to put the, um, you know, the polyester, acrylic, rayon, everything like that. And it's, it's scary. And then also, I'm sure because of AIO, many of you have heard of eutrophication. And that's clearly a huge problem that we can see in the picture on the bottom left. Um, and one side effect, ooh, here's a study quote, one side effect of eutrophication is that the colors and the oil present in wastewater increases the turbidity of the water and gives it a foul appearance and bad smell. So, I mean, you know, duh. But like the effects of eutrophication are huge and they're even larger in impoverished places like these rather than, you know, maybe we have a really polluted river where we live, that's not going to have the same effect as clearly as places like these where they are living up against these riverbanks. They have no, um, they have no facilities to clean these rivers. They have nothing, no regulations in place to keep those pollutants from entering other parts of their lives. So, Sherry told me to add a talk about microplastics in here. So I'm very excited to, to add to, to this topic because it's something that's really, really important to talk about. So anything that you wear that is not cotton, hemp, um, oh, let's see, what else? Sil silk, linen, anything synthetic, will give off um, microfibers, will give off microplastics when they're washed. There's nothing that you can do to stop that from happening. There are ways that you, you can help prevent the microplastics from entering the water stream, which I'll talk about in a bit, but um, there's really, it's horrible. And so the NIH, um, which is actually right next to where I used to live, or where my home is, I'm from Bethesda, Maryland, um, are they've defined microplastics as pieces, plastic pieces less than five millimeters in size. And that's important to distinguish because when you think about it, that's like less than the head of a pin. That's crazy. If you look at that on a ruler or something like that, and how easy that could get into your food, how easy that could get into the water stream, because really it just makes its way up the food chain. And the most these, the most common source of microplastics are from nylon fishing nets and also from clothes when they're washed. Um, and they don't biodegrade because they're plastic. And then they also bind with the molecules. So they attract um, harmful chemicals and they attract other forms of toxic chemicals and substances. And then they continue to make their way up the food chain. And so I mentioned, will your clothes release microplastics? Probably 60% of the clothes that are sold today are polyester, um, which is directly the same exact material as single-use plastic bottles. And so ch chances are your clothes do release microplastics. Um, there have been conflicting statistics on how much or how many microplastics will be released each wash. There's been statistics saying that as much as 4,500 fibers per gram of clothing. Um, and then there's also been things that, also studies that have found that um, there's, you know, 1.7 grams of microfibers are released each wash. And, and then another one that says not, up to 1,900 per wash. And so when it comes down to it, it's, it's really bad either way and some ways that you can reduce it. So there's something called the guppy friend bag. Um, and that takes out about, you just put all your synthetic clothes. So like your workout gear, um, your Patagonia fleece jacket, anything essentially that's made not from the earth and um, put that in the guppy friend bag and put it in the wash. And then that should keep about 70% of the microfibers from entering the water stream. And then eventually you can't really see them for a while until they start really collecting. And then you can just take it out of the guppy friend bag and throw it in the trash, um, which is a much better alternative than just entering the water stream. I think guppy friend 
it's either guppy friend or like a sister company or something like that has uh has kind of has like a part that you can put in your washing machine and to take out the microplastics again it's not perfect it'll be a long time before it is perfect and a lot of washing machine or a lot of people have been pushing for washing machines to actually have this integrated in them because it is such a big issue um but yeah and so they have it's like a part that you put it in oh and so the man who discovered microplastics is in the top right corner his name is mark brown and he was studying all around the coast i think this was actually in the coast of maine where this picture was taken there have been a lot of studies about microplastics on the coast of maine that they found um maybe that's something to integrate into the aio curriculum next summer uh finding microplastics but it's a really interesting thing and it's something that's worth worth doing your own research about and finding out you know like where are they try and find them yourself potentially so yeah that now is, we're going to talk about the gender issue that's so good thing we were going to do this summer we've come up with um, the protocols for testing for microplastics and um where i was working with bruce and caroline a couple staff members who've done this before and so that was actually something we were going to add to like the Soam Sound trip or, you know, one of our water testing trips to get a feel for what kind of plastics are we finding? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. It would be interesting to see, for example, like in some sound where the lobster trap is kind of what you, what, what's in there, what's in the lobster, what did the lobster eat other than that, you know, horrible smelling moose. <laughs> so, <laughs> gender is a huge issue in the garment industry it's 85 percent women who make your clothes and those women it's generally like the only socially acceptable paid work that won't won't threaten their husbands i i feel horrible saying that but really it's it's so much more i guess back in time maybe like 50 years from the united states maybe even more just because it's so it's like women are paid 54% less as garment workers than male garment workers are paid. The gender gap is huge and women have no ability to go up in the ranks to become garment factory owners, to become managers of the floor or anything like that. Those opportunities are not accessible to them at all. And that makes it extremely difficult for them to earn a living wage or to them to, for them to go up the ranks and keep you know like working harder and getting better jobs these jobs are really really hard on you you have to breathe in the toxic fumes you have to breathe in these clothing microparticles and honestly i think microparticles have the worst impact on your on your lungs and things like you know i don't your breathing system um than any other kind of particle just because they, they stay in there and there's no way for it to get out and then also that has a huge impact on the um the flammability of the center that's why so many garment factories like the triangle shirt waste fire and then also so many uh factory fires in bangladesh have happened i think there's been one at least every year that has killed at least 20 people because there's no windows there's no you know they're the doors are blocked off and everything the windows are barred so they can't get out there's no circulation and they can't use um they have to walk up 10 flights of stairs there's for example in rana plaza there were about 500 people working in that garment factory and so imagine if there was a fire 500 people trying to go down all these flights of stairs is really it's not a healthy environment it's not a safe environment and so that's just it's it's not a good situation for these women and it's kind of it's just been created in a way that these women have no choice because there are no really other jobs for them and oh yeah and they can't unionize either which is a huge problem they've been protesting for higher wages i think a couple either last year or the year before they were able to increase the minimum wage in Bangladesh, which is huge, but it's still not even close. It's still about half of the living wage, the calculated living wage. And um, yeah, and so they, it, it's been wonderful. It's been a great stride. And obviously that's better than nothing, but still so many 
women are not being paid minimum wage. And um, because again, there's just this lack of government infrastructure where these laws can be completely ignored, um, specifically for political reasons. They just have difficulty breathing. Oh yeah, and then also the International Textile, Garment, and Leather Workers Federation found that among sweatshops in Central America, so not East Asia, but Central America like Mexico, um, Belize, places like that, uh, women were working or garment workers were working 96 to 116 hours a week and they're not paid for overtime. They're paid per piece and so that allows factories to pay them far, far less than minimum wage and that's a huge issue as well. It's called wage theft. Okay, I'm going to ask you all to go into your little things at the bottom where you can raise your hand Raise your hand if you've seen this image before. None. Ooh. None of you guys have seen this. It's the Rana Plaza collapse. I have an entire episode about it on my podcast where I spent about 40 minutes talking about it. But uh, just like a brief overview, this was April 24th, 2013. Um, there were about 5,000 people. Okay, so go back to my last comment about when there was a fire and people have having to go down 10 stairs. Imagine 5,000 people, not 500. There were 5,000 people working at this garment factory when it collapsed. People were beaten and uh, threatened that they would lose a month's wage if they didn't go into work that day, despite lots of press and, um, and people seeing that there were large two inch cracks in the middle of the building. Uh, and it was, they all, I don't need to talk about like the whole situation, but, um, oh no, can I not? There we go. Um, yeah, so it was, it was a disaster. It was the largest garment, garment disaster, garment factory disaster in history. And over, I think it was 1,134 people died. Um, 2,500 people were injured. And the man who was responsible for it all had to be chased for four days while trying to escape to India with his cohorts. So that was, it was, yeah, and then over 100 still haven't been found. You can see the picture on the bottom right. There were incredible protests. People were just stuck in the rubble. One woman had to saw her arm off in order to get out. It was really, really tragic and something that, you know, people, it's created a lot of reform and a lot of laws that were meant to to change the change the um, change those regulations and then because of this disaster unfortunately you know it took over 1100 people to die in order for this to happen but because of this disaster there were regulations that were put into place uh, factories were inspected in Bangladesh for the first time ever which is appalling because even, you know, workplace office environments here are inspected. And so it's a, you know, our apartment was inspected this morning to make sure the smoke detectors were working. Like, that's crazy that they never inspected these, these factories for literally anything. And companies, oh, companies that were producing at Rana Plaza at the time of the collapse were Primark, Gap, Adidas, Joe Fresh, Mango, and several others. And most of those are still really, uh, really bad offenders with the exception of Adidas did a collection or has been collaborating with Stella McCartney since 2004. And so that's much more um, like that collection is more sustainable, but still those brands are still lagging significantly. Um, I think Gap is still on the list of brands that need to pay their garment workers during the COVID-19 for canceled orders, despite those orders have already been completed. Um, and yeah, so in addition to, there were five original floors that were built of the Rana Plaza building, and then three were added illegally. Um, the building was not monitored closely, and they were, both, both sections were made from really cheap material, and, um, and completely ignored building codes and laws. And then it was also found that after the collapse, Rana, Sohel Rana was the man in charge of it all. And he had political party affiliations 
and connections that got him false signatures that allowed him to continue building these uh, building these buildings and everything like that. So after the collapse, there were two major binding agreements that were put into play to place, like I mentioned, um, and then they were put into place for five year terms. And so those ended in 2018 and they still obviously have a lot of work to do. And there's been some, I think like replacement of those regulations and of those, uh, what are they called? Like laws, alliances. And, um, but they still, essentially they just ended, which is obviously, that takes away a lot of the work that had been done. So textile dyeing and cotton farming are two of the worst offenders and two of the biggest reasons that make, uh, make the factory or make the garment industry unsustainable. So textile dyeing, as we saw with the picture a while ago with pink water, it's a major issue because people don't take notice and don't see it as a problem when the water's green, when the water's um, like bright blue, when the water's brown. It's really only a problem when the water's like purple, red, pink, something like that. And that, that makes it so a lot of these issues go unnoticed and the impacts of the, the dyeing and the toxic chemicals that go into the water are really just like not considered. They're not taken into account by other people. Um, and yeah, so it really, it deteriorates the water quality of all the accessible water around a country or around an area because they can't, they have no clean water other than that. They don't have reservoirs, they don't have filtering facilities or anything like that. So that's what they have. And that's, you know, they're kind of out of luck. They have nothing to drink. So about 40% of all globally used colorants contain organically bound chlorine, which is a known carcinogen. So about 40% of all clothes that we wear, about 40% of all the clothes on the market are known carcinogens are known to cause cancer which is clearly a problem and it's tough because they don't say anything they don't have to nobody has to list ingredients on your clothes you don't have to say what chemicals were in the cotton dye nobody has to say you know what any of these things are until they get away with it oh another issue is water consumption for cotton so cotton farming it's estimated that each year cotton producers use as much as 25% of the world's insecticides and more than 10% of the world's pesticides for a much smaller percentage of the actual crop that's grown. So that's scary considering that's, you know, that's what we wear. And again, like the nicotine patch, like I mentioned, that's absorbed into your skin. So those are two major issues. And then also cotton farming uses an extensive amount of water. A lot of people talk about organic cotton as a better alternative, and that's not necessarily the case because it does use at least as much water as conventional cotton does because of the, because um, cotton, conventional cotton can be genetically engineered to be resistant or like to grow without water or to be resistant to certain chemicals so you don't need as much water um, but organic cotton does and so it uses at least as much water and that's what a lot of conventional cotton activists will say but in reality the farmers that are impacted by the cotton industry are much safer in organic cotton and then also they're paid a better and living wage so yeah I think that's all I have to say. Oh yeah, so here are my resources. If you want, you can take a picture of this. Um, I think that's most of, if there's anything else, I've included it. And then I've also included a short little work cited. And this will be on the Does website. Have <laughs> it'll be at our YouTube channel as well. So you can go back and watch it on the YouTube channel and go to the end to look at this list as well. Um, so I guess my question is, so what do we do? Like how, 
you know, other than, are there things other than from, from what you talked about, I get that we should be careful of what we're buying, look carefully at what we're buying and where it's from. Um, I don't know if there are places you would recommend that are better than other places to buy it from countries, for example. Uh, but secondly, um, you know, not washing your clothes all the time, not washing them constantly, but, you know, washing them once in a while so that you're not releasing all these plastics. Uh, but third, keeping your clothes for a longer period of time and not changing, you know, going through several wardrobe changes <laughs> in, you know, short times or saying, well, I've been seen in that, so I can't be seen in that again, uh, kind of thing. Um, are those all things that you would say, but is there anything else as well? Um, there's a lot of talk on Instagram about washing your clothes on a cooler wash. So not using that hot water just because of energy use. Um, I don't really do that because <laughs> most of the clothes I wash are workout clothes and obviously those need to be cleaned very well. Um, but yeah, and other than that, like I don't, I guess I just wait until my clothes smell bad to wash them. I don't really, is that bad to say? I like smell them <laughs> and <laughs> tell, <laughs> I'm like, is it time? Is it time yet? <laughs> um, but yeah, and then that's a big thing. And then if you want, I have plenty of resources about where to buy. Um, but when you're looking, if you're looking for a sustainable brand, if you're like, oh, this brand seems pretty sustainable, they're talking about it. You have to dig a little deeper and see what fabrics they're using. Because I think Aritzia is a pretty good example. Some of their clothes, it's just women's wear. Some of their clothes are made from like more sustainable fabrics like modal which is made from um forest certified forest safe certified something about like safer forestry tra practices. deforestation practices yeah and um and then others are just made from nylon which is really 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 bad right so it just depends and you just have to look and then also look at the factory conditions and if they don't have Oh, and then another thing is, um, is if they have third party certifications. So it's really, if you, if you want to tell if a brand actually cares, then check out and see if they're a B Corp. And if they have any other certifications like USD organic, fair trade certified, anything along those lines is also important to consider. And you, you mentioned the chemicals a lot, and it was concerning for some people in the chat. You know, it's insane. That's right. That as Rebecca says that our clothes can contain cancer, and they still get away with that. Um, or can, can include, you know, contain cancer-causing carcinogens or chemicals. Um, are they in all clothes? I mean, are we supposed to assume they're just in all clothes? Or are you saying organic cottons and some other things don't have as much of it there's it's oh this is it's so hard because some sustainable brands will talk about how there are no pesticides in the cotton or anything like that but then the dyes that they use they'll use bleach there's i have also an episode on textile dyeing we don't need to get into that right <laughs> now but it's crazy and there are different steps that go into dyeing your clothes including bleaching it from the regular from the natural like off-white color of cotton, they bleach it and then they do a, a bunch to prepare it for dyeing that all involves chemicals and then it involves dyeing and then finishing. So if there's any anti-wrinkle treatment on your clothes, if there's anything, you know, anything that's additional flame retardant is really bad for your skin. And a lot of people who have eczema or other skin conditions will find that if they stop using these chemicals, then they have a lot of relief, which is really cool. That's interesting. I just but, read this. Yeah, it's crazy. I read this morning um, about dryer sheets and how they're meant to the fabric softener on the dryer sheet. Not not only does it get you know again kind of the nylon in them gets released out into the water, but the fabric softener particles are meant to attach to your clothes, and so. It's interesting because like the, that, the article was saying, you know, don't, don't use dryer sheets. I mean, it, cause that attaches to your clothes, it stays on your clothes and that's another chemical that's just on your, in your body, you know, on your body and getting absorbed by your body. Um, so, 
And I know I use like the wool balls and there are other things to use instead of that. Even liquid, you know, um, uh, fabric softener is probably a little bit better than the, the sheet kind of thing itself. So, um, but <laughs> it's kind of scary when <laughs> really when you think about it, it's like we all wear clothes. Well, most of us, we hope that most people are wearing clothing and, uh, you know, that's something we got to look really carefully at and be cautious of what we're buying, pay more attention to it. And, um, you know, I, I'm hopeful. It's really sad to see how it is in other countries and how people are treated there, working there. And often it's to benefit us. It's to benefit people in a first world country. And so it's, uh, that's really difficult. So I hope that people will pay attention to that and, and note where their clothes are coming from and just try to be you know, be better consumers and, and really um, stewards, you know, become better stewards. It's just one more thing to be aware of. So excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Amelia. That was great. Yeah. Uh, one other, let's see if there's, oh, wait. go ahead. Jared has a question. Yes. I so see. go ahead. I, again, I could talk about this all day, <laughs> um, but the, the, <laughs> Yes, your clothes can have COVID-19. You're supposed to let your clothes sit overnight. So for example, if you're clothes shopping or something, let your clothes sit for about 24 hours before you use them and then that should be okay. Um, okay, but anyway, back to Jared's question. Um, so have there been any major cases where someone's clothes have caused them to get cancer? So um, short answer, like we don't really know. It's tough because pretty much I mean, I hate to say this, but like pretty much everything in modern society can cause cancer to some degree, whether that be the pesticides in your food, the different chemicals in your all-purpose cleaners that you're using to just like, you know, clean your kitchen countertops. Um, essentially, anything that you use that isn't completely natural can theoretically give you cancer. And so in that sense, it's not really something bye Brianna <laughs> it's yeah. not really something that um that you can pinpoint there's no trace you can't trace it back point source pollution but that's not the same thing but you know what I mean um so there's no way to actually tell but in terms of things that studies that have been done um studies that have been done and then also just what we know about certain chemicals and the impact that they can have we know that they do have that capability but lots of times skin cancer shows up later in life not when you know we're 15 20 years old that's true when you're closer to my age <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah no my mom had skin cancer too but i am pretty sure that was from sun damage but again like the instances of breast cancer have gone up significantly over the last 100 years who knows why right and we can't pinpoint it but we have some idea yeah there are a lot of things that have changed and where we've gotten higher more diagnoses of you know issues with young kids with people who are older and who knows if that's connected to that or not so excellent all right any other questions looks like we're good Thank you, Amelia, very much. This was wonderful of you to come. Thank you. Good to see you guys. I'm so proud of you guys as you go through and study and learn and, you know, have all this great information. So I really appreciate that you share it with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, I hope I did a good job. I was really you. nervous. Nah, you did great. You did great. You're great. <laughs> all right. Oh, one other. My grandma is a cancer survivor. Yeah. My uh, Rebecca says the great aunt got cancer three times. So cancer is a big um, is a big uh, issue in our in our world. And so any way we can find to not have it and find ways to get rid of chemicals that just don't belong in our bodies, the better. So pay attention, guys. All right, everybody, take care. It was good to see you all. Thank and, you. Uh, the time and Amelia, I'll be in touch. Yes, wonderful. Thanks for your time. You're welcome. Take care. Thank you.